All right, so our final presentation today um, kind of brings it to the, back to the University of Illinois and really emphasizes just how committed the university itself has been um, and continues to be to individuals with disabilities and um, recognizes the kind of support not just within the College of Education but that the university provides and um, Dr. Brad Hedrick is the director of the v Division of Disability Resources and, and Educational Services, DRES, um, here at the university. And he has 38 years of professional experience in the area of rehabilitation and extensive experience and expertise in the administration of adapted sports and recreation for persons with disabilities. He's the recipient of the Toland Award for outstanding achievement in disability sports. And here's the really cool thing. This is really cool. I, I always love this part. Um, he's been in, in, inducted into the National Wheelchair Basketball Association Hall of Fame. <laughs> for his contributions to the development of wheelchair basketball, as well as um, to the National Intercollegiate Wheelchair Basketball Hall of Fame. <laughs> so uh, we have so many, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Olympic medalists here on this campus, and you see them in the grocery store, and I feel like a kid. <laughs> Can I talk to you? So I'll let I'll turn it over to you. Let Thanks, me pull Susan. up your slides. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's fine. Of course, the humbling uh, fact for me is, with all of that, I'm only the second best wheelchair athlete in my family. So, oh man! So there you go. I uh, so uh, when I realized what an extraordinary athlete my wife was, I went into coaching. Um, so let's. Uh, I, I, I think what I, I really enjoyed being here because I honestly did not know the history here with this department and the distinguished faculty and about Sam Kurt and the impact that he's had. And what I, what I have a sense of now is what a remarkable, um, almost undiscovered level of achievement this institution has in service to individuals with disabilities throughout the educational continuum of K-12 and then what I'm going to uh, hopefully be brief, because I know it's lunch, it's approaching, but uh, speak to today in terms of higher education access and disability. And I do sort of feel a kinship to those of you who were attracted to come here and work with, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Kurt, because um, I too left you know, um, a place, not I don't, certainly North Carolina, where we only had three and a half seasons <laughs> compared to Illinois that has two. There's, <laughs> Road repair in winter. And, and giving up North Carolina to come to Illinois uh, expressly for the opportunity to work under the mentorship of someone who was unique. Um, I, I started out in rehabilitation. I was, I was not very well equipped for the Peace Corps in a developing country, so I, went, I did the next best thing. I went to state v VR and uh, in vocational evaluation and spent a long time uh, working to teach individuals with disabilities, mostly cognitive, some emotional, how to perform uh, 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 vocationally relevant tasks in the community to be uh, uh, trained to go into employment, work in the community. And what I learned very quickly in that position was that we were incredibly good at teaching people how to work. But our success rate over time was, was uh, diminished significantly by the fact that we were abysmal at teaching people how to live outside of work. That most of their employment failures were related to the things that happened after work and before work the next day. And when I brought that to the uh, attention of the regional supervisor of vocational rehabilitation that I worked for and said, this seems to be a problem, that we are not addressing the primary barrier to our long-term success with our clientele. And his response was, that's not our mission. That's a mental health job. So I, I decided at that point, I was gonna go get enough union cards that I would never again have to work for another idiot that felt that way about, <laughs> that, that could partition 
service and support for individuals with disabilities and, and, and bear no sense of obligation um, in, in addressing the real problems that more comprehensively and completely. And so, somewhat again like Bob, I uh, had mentors at Carolina, all three had Illinois connections, who said, well, you know, you have an interest that can only be served by one place, and you have to go to Urbana-Champaign and work with Tim Nugent. And I thought, where is Urbana-Champaign? <laughs> and I thought, I, your, one of your early speakers said it was Mars, and I gotta tell you, when I flew in on Ozark, coming in, <laughs> just past the, the glacial advance at Kankakee, and I'm looking out that porthole at, at central Illinois, and I could not have refuted the hypothesis that I had truly passed through a wormhole. <laughs> and I had gone through some sort of interplanetary travel, because I had never in my life seen a place that was so invariant of topography <laughs> and treeless. So, so, uh, but what I, uh, what I discovered, if I, uh, am I doing this wrongly, which, this one. Uh, what I discovered was this extraordinary individual, Tim Nugent, who in 1948 developed, and who also is with us here today, by the way. developed the, first, the world's first post-secondary disability support service program anywhere. Um, and it was in uh, that context that I moved to, the, uh, to a place that may not have been the end of the earth, but I was certain you could see that place from here. <laughs> um, but it was, he was the catalyst. It was his vision and really his unrelenting dedication and passion and any of you who ever probably never had the experience of getting between Tim and his passion know that it was there in his head. His hair used to be very red. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I always felt like uh, I had to know what I was speaking of when I had a conversation with Tim. Um, and, but because of his just persistence and actually his dedication to this in the sense that he worked and ran this program for seven years without any budget. And he led a group of individuals in a caravan to Springfield because when they closed the Galesburg campus of this program, which was a satellite to deal with the number of veterans coming back from World War II with, the, uh, in, with GI funding, they started because it was a VA hospital, it was accessible and they had individuals with disabilities. They closed the campus and 300 letters yet afterward, when they closed that campus to 300 institutions of higher education, including this one, they said no thank you to that program. And yet we're here. <laughs> so that gives you a little bit of insight into Tim. And actually those extraordinary first students who were here, and all of whom, like the folks who have studied here, who came here to be uh, mentored by Dr. Kirk, could be in the same context could see the same facts and yet it envision a completely different reality antithetical to that which everyone held to be absolutely true, an unwavering fact. So uh, what, a, what a tremendous uh, history of this program, 30 years before there was a legal mandate that uh, higher education do anything to become accessible. Um, that, uh, that we were already engaged on this campus. Now I thought really when, with, with Tim's vision, as I, I think there were two things that were very remarkable about it. One, and I think that's attributable to the fact it wasn't an effort to comply with a legal mandate, the focus of the program, and hopefully the focus of the programs uh, in um, all subsequent directorships and all future ones will be always centered on the needs of an individual not the minimalist standard of what do I have to do to ensure I've complied with the law so that OCR, if they come to campus, won't win. In the, in, and, and I think that has guided us very well. The, uh, 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 in, in examples of how that serves us, when we uh, look at uh, ADA access, and certainly this population was primarily physical disabilities in, the, uh, in, in, from, in its early years, that 
we subsequently went about not just having ADA standards, because an ADA standard didn't require a power door on an entry. So a student who couldn't operate a door with a five pound pull load had to have a surrogate to get into a building. A student with a severe disability had to have a surrogate to just operate an elevator to get to the third floor of a classroom. On this campus, looking at needs, what we did was began the seminal research and the pathway in the history of this program that led to the first national standards of architectural accessibility. Um, the, uh, in terms of elevator access, and I'm going to blend in kind of the current and future as I'm talking uh, to try to stay in my time allotment, uh, it, to address the issue of vertical access, which of course our students go to the same locales as all students to try to seek and obtain employment, many of which are increasingly urban and vertical. And uh, st a student, as you can uh, see here, often is in, uh, significantly impaired in the ability to operate the elevators. So what we've done in the last 10 years is work on this campus to devise a system that I think is probably one of the most significant and exciting advancements since Tim's seminal work in architectural accessibility to create a wireless elevator control system that we're gradually uh, installing across campus with a uh, transmitter that is designed to be uh, effectively manipulated by individuals who have uh, pr uh, paralysis, uh, limited range of motion, motor control, uh, to call the elevator, direct it to a floor, to operate the call, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the emergency phone as needed, uh, and allow them the dignity of not waiting in a hallway to ask for someone to assist them with an elevator to control, but to do it for themselves. Um, Again, I, I, I credit that to, the, uh, to that need-centered philosophy that, uh, that uh, Tim embodied here um, uh, long before there was a federal mandate. The, uh, I think the, really ne the next thing that was very remarkable about the philosophy was that at this time in the late 40s when disability was so medicalized and it was strictly an internal state that you possessed, and God, that's just awful. It was unfortunate for you, but that you own your disability. And, uh, and, and that, of course, limited our ability to see the ability of people. Well, I mean, it really did focus on the limitations and, and, uh, and really seemed like a learned helpless kind of a phenomenon that, well, you know, there's just not much we can do about this. Tim's vision was, really that residual ability paradigm that, okay, there are, there, there are uh, uh, limitations that we can uh, probably not impact as significantly, but there are extraordinary reserves in ability that we have left untapped. So we want to um, uh, uh, provide services and supports that minimize the functional limitations of the internal impairment, but at the same time, we have to look at it as a dynamic interaction of that person in an environment. So it is not the fact that the person is incapable of going to class or pursuing uh, 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 and uh, achieving a degree or getting a job and working successfully in a long-term career, it's that the building isn't accessible. We have to change the environment at the same time that we're advancing or diminishing the functional impact of this internal state. And uh, that, again, led to uh, uh, an extraordinary advancements in, uh, uh, um, in the first uh, national international standards of architectural design here on this campus. I think uh, one of my favorite anecdotes of Tim <laughs> was uh, that, uh, the, again, in that medicalized environment, a physician once told one of our a student, uh, just a quad, an individual quadriplegia, a young woman, had quadriplegia, and, and the doctor said, well, I'm sorry, but many things you're going to be unable to do in the future, one of which would be drive a car. And that student enrolled at Illinois and was involved in the program. And, uh, of course, it, uh, Tim uh, it, it included in the comprehensive program driver's education and work to modify the technologies introduced to make that uh, function available to persons with lower, uh, lower limb paralysis. And then uh, she enrolled at Illinois, after enrolling in Illinois and being uh, introduced uh, to some of these services, he invited the doctor to campus. And while they stood outside the building, guess who drove up? <laughs> 
in a convertible and invited the physician to take a ride. So clap for that one. I love that one. That, that uh, philosophy continued in terms of, you know, again, environmental de uh, design beyond curb cuts. I left uh, North Carolina in 1977, and uh, I had never in my life seen a curb cut till I got here. And I thought I'd gone to the equivalent of Disneyland for wheelchairs, because you could literally go almost everywhere on this campus and in this community without having to bounce your wheelchair up a curb, or again, ask for a surrogate for assistance. <laughs> Um, the first bus system that was wheelchair accessible, the prototype of that system was developed and implemented on this campus long again before the ADA had any requirement that such technology exists. Um, we had a, actually a, a visit from the U.S. Access Board that promulgates the standards in, um, in architectural environmental standards for uh, accessibility that came to campus. They were lecturing and meeting with architecture students and they came by the center one day and visited just, and the, these uh, folks on the board said, we, uh, we felt it was important that we come to your building because we just wanted to be where it all began. Again, it's probably like that journey that many make here who say, we just wanna be here at Illinois because we wanna be where these ideas were first created. Um, at the, 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 the seed of what has grown to be an extraordinary movement on behalf of individuals with disabilities. That was, that, these, are, these are some great old shots, all available in the university archives too. Now, blending in some of the current, um, where architectural barriers were the challenge uh, in the 40s, uh, attitudinal barriers were of course the primary challenge, but they manifest often in architectural barriers. Um, the new barriers are the virtual barriers. That, uh, uh, and, and, so, and, and, and in some sense, it's more insidious because at least God, when Tim went to bed, woke up the next morning, uh, the number of buildings that had been built on campus that were inaccessible only gone, went up by small increments, right? They, they didn't build buildings that rapidly. Today, Millions of web pages on this campus alone can be promulgated in hardly any time whatsoever. And, uh, and we uh, continue, though we've made some strides in that domain, we continue today to marginalize people who should be empowered by this technology. And I do think, uh, again, a, a, a pitch that I would make, of one of the, this is an area of research in our unit, it's one that we should have a kinship with because there is no more marginalizing influence today than the, than the uh, uh, development and dissemination and, and institutionalization of technologies that further marginalize people with disabilities. Now what we're doing in this domain is working to develop best practices. Um, we, uh, the idea of standards, we have, we have developed extraordinary standards. The W3C has standards on web and IT accessibility. The problem with the standard is the developers and designers and authors of content are too busy to, and, and, uh, to read a cryptic standard and try to interpret what that standard means in practice. So our approach has been, let's work from the developer perspective, come up with design techniques that if introduced, would, automat would uh, uh, automate the uh, uh, adherence to the standards. Um, and so we developed these. We then developed authoring tools that uh, would automate the design practices that promote the standards. We did that for Microsoft Office. What we learned in that experience was that um, uh, first, if people don't perceive themselves as having a problem, they probably won't seek a tool to, to avoid it. Um, and that secondly, most people who use these tools uh, really don't understand all of the functionality. That, uh, so in a document, when you make a heading, most people still today <laughs> will go into bold, make it larger, make it dark, and make it pretty and different and call that a heading. But to a screen reader, they can't see that content, it's just text. Um, and so we realized what we really need to do is focus more on the punishing aspect of audit and so we've developed auditing tools that will, uh, we now just released one that uh, uh, the FAE uh, 2.0 Functional Accessibility Evaluator and the A-Inspector for Firebug and Firefox, which are developer tools, um, 
that are uh, uh, auditing uh, uh, resources that you can use to spider through institution level websites and produce readable reports that administrators and developers can use to try to understand what needs to be done to a web resource or a digital resource to render that uh, more accessibly to individuals with disabilities. Um, we also collaborated uh, more recently with uh, Enterprise Insights uh, uh, here on campus called eText at Illinois. We've done that for a couple of years to create, because uh, one of the problems of, again, adding ramps to buildings is the buildings go up pretty slowly so that ad hoc approach can work. But in this domain, ad hoc only gets you further behind. It's an exponential growth curve. And so, in effect, you can't fix it at a rate fast enough. You have to make sure it's designed universally and accessibly at the beginning um, in order to, uh, to ever have effect. So, eText Illinois uh, ultimately has resulted in the development of, what, uh, of a state-of-the-art digital textbook and with, a, uh, in, with the reading infrastructure around that, that is also navigable and accessible to people with disabilities. And, uh, uh, rec and last year, actually, we're very excited that it was received accommodation from the National Federation of the Blind. I'm always happy when they come and give me an accommodation, accommodation and don't just sue us. Uh, <laughs> and uh, which they have a propensity for doing. And uh, to, to say this is an extraordinary resource, we appreciate the leadership and hope that other institutions may even adopt the use of this tool uh, in their uh, online educational uh, uh, offerings. Um, another area that we've uh, addressed as a, a trend change, you can see here, these are just data over the last 10 years. When I took over in 95, I had 50 students with LD, and interestingly, no students with a psychiatric or psychological disability. Now, I wasn't so naive as to believe we had no students with psychological disabilities at Illinois, but that it was clearly evident we weren't serving them. Uh, so uh, we look at these trends and we see extraordinary growth with ADHD and psychological impairment over the last 10 years, but again, in 1995, those numbers were zero. So we, we worked to develop a practice with our counseling center and our mental health unit to say, when students come into your programs and say, I'm struggling, I'm doing poorly, I've never had this kind of history, um, and, and I'm about to be withdrawn or dropped from the university, I've been on probation, what can I do? We developed a screening protocol to identify whether or not disability could be ruled out as a cause, and if not, we extended to them free comprehensive neuropsychological assessment to try to identify whether or not there was um, an undiagnosed learning disability or cognitive disability or emergent or undiagnosed psych uh, psychological disability that was the root cause of this uh, problem. And uh, the goal being that uh, we sold it to the university that it's in your best interest because this is a percentage unknown to you that is contributing to your drop to, that is flattening out your retention and your graduation rates, and you have no capacity to identify, serve, and uh, to address the impact they're having on your retention and graduation rates. Um, so with the testing, we also looked at it and said the paradigm of physical disability won't work here. And so we needed different services. We needed academic coaching services for the students who uh, have impaired uh, executive uh, functioning. And we need uh, clinical counseling. Why? Because many students in student insurance uh, can't af afford or get access to a clinician for therapeutic counseling, which is the one thing they often need the most. And uniformly, all campus counseling services are short-term in nature. And if you go in with a recurring long-term need for counseling, you will be denied service, uniformly. And so we said this is another program that uh, is absolutely critical if we're going to uh, offer equal access opportunity and, uh, for success to this uh, emergent population. Uh, making a long story short, since 2000, we've had 1900, over 1,900 students uh, who were at risk of being dropped by the university who underwent screening. Almost 1,600 uh, were uh, referred then for testing, comprehensive testing. 1,400 of those 
uh, were identified as having undiagnosed or emergent disabilities um, and then extended accommodations, which are required, would be available and provided in a court required by law, but also access to the academic coaching uh, and the uh, clinical counseling. And uh, through that program, we've had none of the students that we've identified and who have been introduced and participated in these programs who have had to withdraw from the university and of those who have been here long enough to graduate, we have a 97% graduation rate. Um, we, we, we know by my introduction, we have uh, looked not only at curricular access, but that also we are concerned about co-curricular access of students, that they have opportunities to flourish and to grow and to develop in those areas that are uh, complementary to the classroom. And wheelchair sport was developed here, again, as a mechanism for promoting health and wellness, um, but also uh, helping social acceptance because it, as Tim always said, it's very difficult in a lifetime of lectures to educate a pop, the general public on the many functional differences of varying impairments and how they affect life and what the actual abilities of individuals with myriad impairments are. But one thing they do understand is what it takes for someone to shoot and make three out of five shots from three point line. <laughs> so, so skill in this is something that is, A, very valued in this culture, whether you appreciate that or not, and it's uh, recognizable in our culture. And so it was uh, a wonderful program to try to uh, counter the many disparaging stereotypical beliefs about disability at that time, and I think even today. Um, so in, in that domain, we continue that, uh, certainly with lots of Paralympic success. Had we uh, been ranked among the nations in the London Paralympics, uh, we would have uh, come out 10th in gold medals among uh, the 130 some nations that were in the Paralympics in London. Um, but more importantly, and uh, I, you know, I will show this to anyone who'd like to see it at the end, uh, the, 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 the impact that it has personally, and I've got a video vignette here of a young man and his mother. Uh, who was uh, hit by a drunk driver in the hospital. He had been athletic and engaged in many things in school, lamenting that his life was going to be completely changed. All the things he loved were going to be inaccessible and unavailable. His mother wondering, what future will my son have? And then they actually saw in, from his hospital bed, uh, my wife, who was the better athlete in my family, um, <laughs> when the 800 meter uh, uh, women's event in the LA Olympics. And so they both, they had this epiphany together of that's what I can do. And then, uh, and, and he enrolled in Illinois and went on to an outstanding career with, math, with uh, graduating baccalaureate and his master's degree. He's now uh, an advocate for uh, health and wellness programming for children with disabilities in Georgia. Um, and uh, again, I will, uh, in the interest of time, continue. Uh, residential services for students with severe disabilities is another program Tim developed in 1958. We had our first student who needed personal assistance enrolled at Illinois. At Berkeley, they, a gentleman there, Ed Roberts, had to sue the university to get in. Here, in, uh, before, long before Ed had to sue Berkeley, we were enrolling students who needed personal assistance and housing them through, at that time, a partnership with a local nursing home. We then built a residential uh, house owned by a member of the staff to, advance, to house students who needed personal assistance and their PAs um, in the early 60s. And then in 81, we opened Beckwith Hall. Uh, we, uh, uh, since uh, Beckwith served about 190 students from 81 until it was closed, uh, in 2010, and uh, we had about an 84% graduation rate in students with the most severe physical disabilities, uh, and even better, almost half of those students uh, had employment within a year of graduation, and another uh, almost half, well, it, it was about 45%, went on to graduate professional school. And now these data were slammed a bit by, our, by the economy in the last, uh, since 2009, but I think uh, it, it was 90% success rates in the, after a year uh, at Beckwith. 
Now it's dropped to about 85% uh, outcome, successful outcomes postgraduate uh, with the impact of the economy. But an extraordinary dif differential compared to the likely outcomes that these uh, the individuals with such disabilities might experience otherwise and their underrepresented uh, status in employment. Um, an example was uh, uh, Kevin Fritz. Kevin Fritz uh, was told by his family physician, again, some of these things persist well beyond Tim's period, that even in the last 10 years, a family physician told this young man, if you go to Illinois, you're going to have to have 24-7 nursing attendance. Well, <laughs> you know, he wasn't going to come to Illinois 24-7 with a nurse by his side. Uh, and he didn't really, he didn't need to. And he enrolled, uh, he was uh, incredibly uh, 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 diligent in his effort to acquire the knowledge and skill to manage his disability on his own. And as a result of his persistence and diligence, his intelligence, and the impact of that programming, Within two years, by his sophomore year, he had an internship in Washington, D.C., working for then this, this uh, gentleman who was a senator at that time uh, in Washington. He went on to Washington University, got his law degree, and he's now practicing attorney in Chicago. Um, and again, uh, I think those are uh, things that are all a part of the legacy that Tim has left us, and I, my time is running out, right? Okay, so. <laughs> Uh, we have advanced that to Nugent Hall that's now integrated into Nugent with a very high-tech uh, uh, environment with lifts in every room so that students may be able to move themselves around the room without the need of a surrogate or PA or with fewer PAs to assist them than they might otherwise require without it. Um, and, and again, another vignette about uh, Nugent that we can show you there. Uh, but uh, University of Florida re visited last year uh, took a visit of the residence hall, and based on what they saw in Nugent, uh, they've elected to uh, build a state-of-the-art, new state-of-the-art residence hall on the campus of the University of Florida, and they are going to incorporate housing and programs equivalent to that which they witnessed in Nugent Hall uh, through Beckwith Residential Support Services. So uh, we are advancing now to apply what we've known in service to myriad people with uh, populations with disability and uh, through residential supports of Beckwith with veterans with poly impairment from Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we're building a $14 million center in the hopes of uh, creating best practices for a, no, for a new emergent population of veterans that are ever bit as, mis, an, uh, as much an unknown or misunderstood uh, as the veterans who arrived on this campus were in 1949. And again, there we're looking forward to opportunities to collaborate with faculty in interdisciplinary work to better understand what is an effective practice with a population that has a physical disability, uh, sensory disability or uh, vision, hearing, brain injury, um, and PTSD. I mean, these are extraordinary conditions that uh, uh, will require considerable study and effort to better understand and support. Um, and with that, I probably uh, should conclude. Uh, thank you very much again for inviting me here. Have a great rest of your day.